Welcome to The Choice. I'm Kurt Doolittle. This is episode three. It's a Q&A on Catholicism, trifunctionalism, and the natural law. I'm going to respond to questions from two people. First, from George. Hi, Kurt. I haven't done a deep dive into propertarianism yet, but I've watched a number of videos through John Mark's YouTube channel, and I'm more of a theocracy-based, freedom-to-do-good, republic-oriented person. I want to interject that. I really like that. But from what I've seen so far, the proposed expression of propertarianism can run in harmony with the ideals. I'm going to interject again that that's the whole idea. (laughs) I hope so. Thanks for thinking outside the traditional boxes and inside practical and diverse people-filled world. Well, uh, George, first, I want to say thanks for being one of the few people that understands the difference between freedom to do good and the constraint on doing bad law. My my job is only to do to constrain the bad so that the faithful have the faithful, whether they are spiritual, rational, or otherwise, uh, are able are limited to doing good. <laughs> Thank you for your, uh, he continues with, thank you for the affirmation, Kurt. I have a vision in me to see the establishment of an alliance, sort of like late NATO, but among individuals, communities, and nations globally, including armies that covenantly affirm their alignment with one God, his two values of loving God and neighbor, as well as his 10 command, uh, governing commandments regarding ownership affir- affirmations, boundaries, and related reciprocities. This could form a life, liberty, and property-grounded commonwealth of nations. Well, to some degree, I really agree with this. Uh, I don't think it's possible to have under one God, uh, simply because we are all, just as you're invested in yours, others are invested in theirs, and there doesn't seem to be any hope of changing that. And the people most invested in their God are the, a danger to humanity at present. On the other hand, I'd like to have a world united in living in concert with God's laws of the physical law, the natural laws of human cooperation, reciprocity, the Christian law of love toward others, and the evolutionary law of necessity of transcendence. So the major difference there is the means of expression, (laughs) Uh, because otherwise those two, our two statements are uh, identical, and I think that's one of the rather cunning things you're trying to suggest there, so I go along with it. Uh, I want to be a little of a a bucket of cold water, though, um, and uh, say that while I agree with this beautiful vision and I share the underlying sentiments, uh, I might differ in how we might have to express that sentiment, but it is a beautiful vision. But it's a beautiful vision until you travel the world and meet people with influence, wealth, power, and a military power who have very different visions that are completely hostile to yours and mine. The faithful, like women, by design, live in a bit of an echo chamber even when they travel the world. We tend to see, meet with, and work with people we prefer to act with, and we attribute to them through a cognitive bias, which is endemic in man and more so in women, which is that we tend to think we're average and other people think like us. We overestimate that. This is partly true to due to the fact that language provides commensurability between our experiences. So when we speak in the same words, we assume these things have the same experiences behind them when they don't. So I never ever make the mistake that a community of faith scales beyond, the, beyond those who one knows personally. Just as female cognition fails, Alice is going to add something after I respond to your note here. Female cognition fails beyond those who know one another personally, just as male cognition succeeds pretty much only beyond those, one who, those who know personally. Men tend to think of the world in aggregates and politically, just as women tend to, uh, and of necessity evolutionary necessity see the world as individuals with whom they can empathize. This goal of harmony is the same reason women have failed in politics in the 20th century and that their inclusion in the political process without giving them a separate house as if they were a separate class has caused the crisis of the 20th century. 
Uh, it is why the church also failed to ref- uh, as a political system, and why neither Jews nor Islam can produce a political system, but why Jews remain dependent on post populations, just as females remain dependent upon males for political order. And this is why the Muslims cannot organize anything beyond a family or family business or a government other than tri- of tribal despots or a military capable of other than small group acts of terrorism. The family, neighborhood, local church community, and village doesn't scale. God's evolution of us divided the female and male cognitions for a reason so that we could divide the labor of understanding his universe. Because for every man like you that seeks consensus, peace, and harmony, there are men like me who seek power to bend man, beast, animal, plant, and world, and universe to our will. And I would protect you from those who are like me and unlike you. And the moment people like you are marginally successful with your vision, the men like me in competing cultures, states, empires, and civilizations will conquer you for your folly. This has ever been and ever will be the case. Because God left us with these rules, the laws of nature, the natural law of man, the Christian law of love, and the evolutionary law of transcendence. Although the Christian law of love seems to be an exclusive, in other words, the Christian law of universal love seems to be an exclusive property of Western civilization at present, and we don't seem to be able to spread it. There isn't any steady state. There's no condition of eternal peace. There is no rest. The faithful, like women, seek a steady state free of competition, conflict, and the need to negotiate between different goals. And steady state means you are just a human herd, food for the Red Queen of Evolution, because you've forgotten and denied that God gave us the evolutionary law of transcendence and set us in competition with one another so that those of us who defied that law would be eradicated by those who obey that law. In fact, I would make the rather obvious argument that the Abrahamic faiths exist for the sole purpose of denying God's laws of transcendence, which is why the Jews, besides being the most literate people in Europe for a thousand years, accomplished nothing except volumes of mysticism and turned their entire religion into an organized crime family. They accomplished nothing until they were integrated into Aristotelian empiricism by Europeans in exchange for their inclusion into the society, which they immediately sought, as women do to alphas, to undermine. And the Muslims, conversely, without getting a, a being able to completely conquer us, consumed and destroyed every, every single civilization of the ancient world and are now threatening to destroy ours. So ignoring one of God's sets of rules is, a, to, is at the consequence of obeying the others. You have to obey them all or you will be defeated. This is why God gave us all these rules, because Christians like the female share this violation of God's rule of transcendence. Christians are in, always in, a, in the position of envisioning just what it is that you desire, a female state of herd, an infinite peaceful harmony of non-conflict, which would only render us victim of nature and man. This denial of one of the four sets of God's laws is why Christianity is failing among the educated classes and evolving into a folk religion and has lost its chances, possibly forever, as a political religion. So Christianity will either adapt to the necessity of trifunctionalism, the competitive compatibility between military, the judicial, and the faithful, or it will continue to be the cause of our collective decline, because it's too selfish to obey one of God's laws, the organized use of violence by the militia to defend the faith, its people, and the law that together are the only people on this earth who have transcended man out of superstition, ignorance, hard labor, poverty, starvation, disease, suffering, and the chaos of the natural world that has given us all but 12,000 years of respite, but otherwise has sought to exterminate us with regularity. Love doesn't conquer all. Love serves only to integrate the conquered into loving one another in conformity of, with God's laws revealed by God's hands and not in the scripture written by men for the purpose of obtaining political power. The unconquered are the enemy of our people, our God, our God's laws of transcendence and as a consequence of mankind, and our destiny to sit at the right hand of the Father of us all. Ellis says in response that love is capable of conquering all in the close-knit feminine realm. All in terms of self and self-development, 
in terms of family and in terms of immediate community, assuming reciprocity of that love is granted. This is the trick of Jesus' testimony to us. It is, in the end, love will eventually conquer those you have an interpersonal relationship with and bring them into reciprocity with you. This is the secret of Jesus' teaching. It extends the natural law by what is not obvious from the resolution of disputes alone. This is why it was such a profound innovation, and it's why the one of the reasons why the West was able to form a majority middle-class civilization under rule of law, and no one else has been able to. She continues that on larger scales, love must be replaced with respect, and respect itself is much harsher in judgment than is love. Both enemies and friends must be respected, perceived in alignment with their proper place, and treated accordingly. Next, Cole asks the following questions. These are my very serious questions. I think they are... Why doesn't propertarianism promote Christianity? Two, how does propertarianism account for the dignity of the human person by future, uh, virtue of their potential for relationship with God versus their potential for advancing civilization? Three, I don't think Christianity is argued in the same way as other faiths, in other words, by moral baiting. Like I try to say, this is the unique and unrepeatable Christian response to suffering and relationship that really converts and, quote, saves souls. For Christianity civilized the West and not the other way around. I don't understand the idea that Early Christianity was another religion of warfare from within. Christianity was spread by its own blood, not the blood of others. Five, the church was always meant to lead the state and not compete with it. Like I said, the latter was embedded in the former, even when it deviated from its philosophy and practice. These are great questions, and to start off with, I'm going to repeat something you're going to hear me quite often. And that's that there are a set of grammars in our civilization. These grammars, the most common of them, are theological, philosophical, what we would call moralizing and legal scientific thought. And it's difficult to transition between these because we tend to gravitate toward one or the other. And this is because the tests of, say, three theological obedience philosophical choice and legal scientific decidability and matters of conflict are completely different systems of making decisions. In each system of thought, we can vary from, let's say, a Christian wisdom or theological wisdom uh, to philosophical choice to decidable necessity. Now, we don't tend to think of these things as, say, arithmetic, algebra, and geometry, but they are essentially that kind of pattern. To think in terms of law and science means eliminating what's false and irreciprocal so that only the true and reciprocal or, quote, good remain. But the law does not determine the good. The law only determines what's false and irreciprocal. The people must choose, individually, by groups, by church, or by state, what good they prefer. The court doesn't. The law doesn't. The idea here is that it forces the cooperation and exchange and by consequence creates the civil society we all want to live in, or at least we want others to grant us, (laughs) even on our terms. So, while the theological world attempts to sculpt with clay, in other words, to build something in its in an image, the legal scientific world attempts to carve away the stone, leaving what is underneath exposed. In other words, one of us tries to build a truth and the other t- tries to remove the falsehood. This is the difference between the positive and the negative, and it's a difficult transition for the faithful, just as the reverse is a difficult transition for the legal scientific. The difference between spiritual, meaning emotional, imaginary, and intuited, and the material, meaning intellectual, actionable, and observable, is well understood in the philosophical literature as the difference between experience and action. Experience and observation overlap, but the positive information from experience and the negative information from action are not the same. There isn't the same reaction to, uh, there isn't anything to bounce emotions against other than what's there, whereas when 
when we try to take action, sometimes we fail, and it's the, fa- the failure is rather evident. I'm not going to don't want you to take that too far, but in simple terms, I'm trying to again show the difference between the internal and the confirmatory and the external falsificationary. Experience and observation overlap, but the positive information from experience and the negative information from action, again, are not the same. There is more felt with experience than is observed. Both faith and science depend on this difference. Faith to say there is no more, there is more to life and the material, and law science to say there is a means of settling conflict by the deservable and material. This is because we differ in our inner worlds. Lastly, there is a difference between P law, or propertarian law, the natural law of sovereignty, within the limits of proportionality and my opinion. Now, I have opinions, and sometimes it's difficult, as I and I can understand, to tell the difference between when I'm making a statement about the law, which is as rigorous as making a sta- statement about, say, geometry, and when I'm giving my opinion. My opinion is still my opinion. My opinion is a preference. So, first question, why doesn't propertarianism promote Christianity? Well, first, that's not really true. Law doesn't promote, it prohibits. Science doesn't promote, it explains. We explain, we or I, explain why Jesus' teachings were true and an innovation. We state them in scientific terms. Christianity is completely compatible with natural law, extends natural law, it provides what natural law does not, which is Jesus' teaching of love, and it contributes to high-trust commercial society with middle-class majority ethics. And there's a reason Christians get wealthy quickly on moral basis, just as there's a reason why other cultures don't get wealthy, or they get wealthy on an immo- only on an immoral basis. As such, when I work in the natural law, it tends to look like pr- the work prohibits most other religions other than Christianity. This is partly because our law originally was natural law, it always has been since our foundation thousands of years ago, and that the incorporation of Jesus' teaching into that society pr- still existed on top of that underlying legal structure. So by the time we get to the scholastics, you know, we go through Aristotle, by the time we get to the scholastics, who are themselves trying to prohibit what they see as the evils of the Spanish con- conquerors, by the time we get to that point, we are we see that the church has unified both the natural law and Jesus' teaching. Uh, this continues through the Enlightenment as we express this in increasingly scientific terms. By the time we get to the 20th century, we can model it out, and we know from economics and the other data that, well, I'm sorry, there's just no better way of doing things than the natural law and Jesus' extension of it. So we don't necessarily promote Christianity, we prohibit its competitors. We don't advance a thing, we prohibit the things that are false and irreciprocal. Well, frankly, there aren't any other compatible religions than Christianity, and so we're sort of stuck here. So, by via negativo, this is how we end up with Christianity. We don't consider practicing the heathen, love of nature and our ancestors, pagan, love of heroes and archetypes, and Christian, love of God, together as incompatible. We understand this is the evolution of our natural religion of European peoples, from the familial to the tribal to the cultural to the political, which is the evidence, and we see this everywhere, of the evolution of our religion. And to some degree, we maintain these three three pieces, we just practice them with different weights. Where I grew up, we practiced, uh, we still had quite a bit of the Germanic myths as a part of us. I don't see it myself as a competitor of the church, but then again, I'm from Northern Europe, so I would, of course, see it that way. There are three sets of laws that God has shown us with the evidence of his hand. In other words, this isn't the words of man claiming they've heard the word of God. This isn't some theologian or doctrinal pontification, we can see the laws of nature, the natural law of reciprocity, the Christian law of extending familial love to extended kin, and the evolutionary law of transcendence. We can see these as evidence in the universe, regardless of what men says. That the fact that Christianity is largely compatible with these in most ways merely means that it's just least divergent of the religions that exist. Now, the fundamentalist or the literalist Christianity is not compatible with the laws of nature. 
nature or science. Because of this, it's often incompatible with the evolutionary law of transcendence. Now, we have two different questions here. First is, what caused us to evolve, whether that was the natural structure of the universe making it a necessity, a deity that the spirit of a god in the universe, or an actual god that exists and directs this cause is one half of the equation, and I'm not sure how much it matters to each person which one of those it is. The other is whether our job is to continue to transcend, in other words, to make man into a peer to God, or is to leave him as a subject. In other words, are we supposed to stay in our current form, or are we supposed to evolve into something better? Uh, these are the two questions. The evidence is we need to always defeat the Red Queen. We have only so much time, and so that we don't have a choice, we have to keep evolving. Now, uh, whether we would do this morally or immorally, ethically or unethically, or at high risk or low risk is different things, but to some degree we do have to continue revolving. These are the only incompatibilities that I know of with the evidence of God's hand. So wherever religion is incompatible with God's hand, then the men who wrote that religion erred. We seek to solve the problem of the incompatibility of our religions with the evidence of God's hand. This leads one to the conclusion that the deists are pretty often right, and Jesus was right, and the Jews, Muslims, and church uh, dogmatists were wrong, but wrong only because they were doing the best they could with the primitive knowledge of God's hand they had at the time. The basics underlying Christian faith, meaning God's soul, Jesus' teachings, Ten Commandments, His property rights, and devotion, etc., are all compatible with the evidence of God's hand in one way or another. And that doctrine does succeed in causing the faithful to behave in accordance with God's hand, which is a different. This is always the question. Does it matter what you think, or does it matter what others observe by your behavior? What we would like, of course, is that both of these things are the same. Uh, these things aren't always the same. There are very many people who consider themselves good Christians who by their observable actions are not. It doesn't so much matter what you believe if it doesn't result in your actions. Next question. How does propertarianism account for the dignity of the human person by virtue of their potential for a relationship with God versus their potential for advancing civilization? Well, we say it in scientific terms. If you demonstrate by your actions that you follow the evidence of God's hand and you don't act to counter to the evidence of God's hand, then you are due dignity and respect, just as those who do not do not deserve dignity and respect. However, your experience is not observable. In other words, we can't tell what your internal experience is, and we can only tell your actions. Uh, how you believe and feel is not observable and decidable by other than your actions. If you don't treat others as Jesus would demand, then you are not Christian, regardless of what you feel and believe. This means that if you hallucinate some fantasy that you are uniquely gifted with understanding Jesus and God, or that your particular sect is superior to all other Christian sect, it doesn't really matter what you think if others observe your display, word, and deed as incommensurable with the teachings of Jesus. This is the danger of a personal relationship with Jesus and God. Are you, in fact, a disciple of Jesus, or are you just another psychopath trying to find an excuse to act selfishly toward others by ignoring them and satisfying your interest without engaging? in Christian charity. There are many Christians who use Christianity as a means of doing nothing at all, but because uh, others are not conforming to the demand. This is the ultimate selfishness, ultimate deceit, ultimate Christian denial of Jesus' teaching, and the ultimate heresy against Christianity. These people are not Christian, they're just evil dressed in Christian garb. There are hundreds of Christian sects, and all that they share is some point on the spectrum between the priority for a tyrannical God of the Old Testament Semites that Jesus tried to reform in a loving God evidence in Jesus' behavior and teaching, or even some of us, for Jesus is a philosopher who was speaking in the language of theology because that was all that was available to the people he was preaching to. Your faith is in your mind, but your behavior exists in this world and the, with the rest of us and is observable. So in this sense, propertarianism, which is my understanding of God's natural law of sovereignty and reciprocity within the limits of proportionality, only judges your actions because no law can judge your mind, and each of us is notoriously bad at judging our own minds. 
Now, I think the part I didn't answer correctly in there or sufficiently in there was whether you have value in your faith alone or you have value in your value to mankind. Again, I'll take the opposite, the via negativa, and say, well, it's not that you have to have value, it's that we cannot test your faith. On the other hand, if you are adhering to Jesus' teachings, you're adhering to the laws of God's hand, then you are, by definition, not causing harm. So it's not that you have to add to society. It's that you can't harm it. Next question. I don't think Christianity is argued in the same way as other faiths, uh, meaning moral baiting. And like I tried to say, it is the unique and unrepeatable Christian response to suffering in a relationship with the, that really converts and saves souls. Well, as an example, the production, the presumption that man's soul needs saving is the creation of a false debt. Sure, you will live a better life. Uh, because those around you will live a better life by following the teachings, teachings of Jesus, and you will make the world a better place, uh, thereby insulating yourself and others from the animal impulses within us all. If you do so, you will save your soul from emotional suffering in this world and the next. You will save others from this suffering in this world and next, and you will make the world a better place in this world and the next. To save yourself from physical suffering requires more than saving yourself from emotional suffering. That is, where science, technology, and medicine provide what faith does not. There is the second part of this question, which is that Christianity attempts to provide a response to suffering. This is an interesting question because uh, one has to be in the position where one considers one's self-suffering in the first place. Uh, Very few of us do today. Uh, It was not a presumption in the ancient world. It was, and so we're having a little difficulty with the idea that we would be suffering in the first place. There is a not too healthy strategy underneath this solution that uh, I won't go into. Maybe I'll address it other time. So whether you think you're suffering and you're converts and save souls, yes, Christianity will save you. Uh, there is ev- evidence around the world for this that if you ha- get into a very pled place in your life and you need love because you cannot get it elsewhere, you will find it. Jesus Christ. That's absolutely true. We have seen it everywhere. Um, There are groups of people that can be saved by it and people who cannot. There are people who cannot be saved whatsoever, and there are people who have to be saved by other means, whether those are uh, more rational or scientific. Some people it doesn't work for, just as the 12 steps don't work for some people. But the record of Jesus saving people from emotional and psychological suffering is huge. The record of Jesus saving people from physical suffering uh, is not. Next question. Christianity civilized the West and not the other way around. I don't understand the idea that early Christianity was another religion of warfare from within. Christianity was spread by its own blood, not by the others. My answer is, why did Christianity, a Jewish heresy, spread among Europeans, a rabbinical Judaism among the Jews, and Islam, a Christian heresy, among the Arabs and non-Europeans, because of what these people were doing beforehand? It's simply not true that, other than a tiny minority, accepted Christianity willingly. This is a fabrication by the church. The church is a master of fabrication, uh, just as it integrated in pagan holidays and ancient pagan religions into Christianity. The church rewrote history in its own favor, just like we all write history in its own favor. In all cases I know of, religion was imposed upon them by leaders who found political value in it. It was a useful tool for political control of people, and it provided them with a literate administrative class to the priesthood to manage them and tax them even better. Even during the high Middle Ages, Ages, the documentary record looks a lot like political correctness is practiced today. That means the common people give it lib surface, the urban elite go along, and the upper classes use it for virtue signaling, with a minority of purists truly devoted to the faith, just like today. There were people back then who wrote evangelical literature the same way there are people writing virtue signaling political correctness today. So the spectrum always exists. In, in fact, it doesn't look like outside of the urban cities, Christianity was all that effective at, until, the, until a very late in time, and these people were basically paying lip service to the church while they were living as, the most hedonistic and pagan lifestyles they could possibly get away with and doing as little work as possible while still being able to survive. Fortunately, we have a lot of docu- documentation from outside of the church, and the writings of these people are decidedly medieval, meaning pretty barbaric 
barbaric right up until the Enlightenment. One of my favorite uh, scholars of the medieval period says, I've spent my life living within the words of these people, and they aren't, there aren't any of them you would like to meet. Next question. The church was always meant to lead the state, not compete with it. Like I said, the latter was embedded in the former, even when it deviated from its philosophy and practice. The church was forcibly imposed on Europe by the Greeks after they defeated Rome and reconquered it. They closed the Stoic schools, they closed the Greek temples, they, they killed or outcast the philosophers, they destroyed the arts, the literature, and the knowledge of Greek Greco-Roman civilization. The purpose of the church was to prevent the restoration of the Roman European aristocracy so that the, the Byzantines could maintain political and military control, as well as financial control, over the Western Empire. Some monks in the north, particularly Ireland, worked to save what little knowledge remained in Europe. Some Middle Easterners saved the work of some of the Greeks and Romans who had fled there, then destroyed the rest with the Muslim conquest. The problem was that the church was far more corrupt than the state it sought to replace, so that after the institution of the church, we had the monastic movement to defend the people from the church, then the Protestant Reformation to defend the people from the church, then the Renaissance Reformation and scientific revolution to escape the corruption of the church. By the time of the late Middle Ages, the church had managed to accumulate half of the land in Europe and had essentially turned half of the population into serfs that served the church so that the church fathers could live off the, live off the proceeds. Jesus, on the other hand, was a grift from God. He was the only Christian so far that we know of. American evangelical Protestantism is the closest religion to the one Jesus imagined, and the church as a political institution the farthest thing from the one he would imagined. So the church failed in the early medieval period. It failed in the high medieval period. It was punished during the restoration of European civilization. In the 19th century, it failed again in response to the discoveries of science. And it has been destroyed by the Marxist postmodernist feminist revolution against both Christianity and aristocracy. I mean, it wasn't even able to defend against a, an alien invasion. And it wasn't until the middle of the 20th that Protestant evangelicals finally cast off the corruption of the church and returned Christianity to religion of the people by the people in imitation of Jesus Christ. I have seen evangelical preachers take Christianity even closer to its roots by teaching Christianity as an intuitive and more emotional close relation to our ancient religion of Stoicism and our scientific understanding of cognitive behavioral therapy. My understanding of Christianity is that an attempt to use Jesus' teachings to create an institution of governments and oppression, where Jesus was trying to lift poor, ignorant people out of tribalism so they were not the permanent underclass and they could take taken advantage of by users and tyrants by loving each other, in other words, ending the habitual endemic habit of Middle Easterners to lie, cheat, steal, and deceive each other and instead by loving each other as the greatest resistance movement against tyranny, whether it was from the family, tribe, nation, or whatever recent empire that ruled them. So I'm pretty personally hostile to churchianity, despite growing up in the church and having my, of course, the normal fascination with churches and architecture. Um, but I consider myself a Christian who seeks to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, which are most of the time reducible to nothing more than love thy neighbor at all costs. I'm not sure anything Anything else is required. There are five principles buried in Christian teaching. Every one of them is reducible to love thy neighbor and thy conscience shall be free. That's it. All the rest of it that comes from it, of course, is something I have discussed elsewhere. Thank you, Kurt, for next question. Thank you, Kurt, for your in-depth responses. I think my opinions here are generally representative of intellectual Catholicism today and throughout history, so finding reconciliation in our views is important. Not to say that I'm the one to do that, but I do want to do what I can. I personally need to have some more clarity before I can comfortably sell natural law to Catholics and Christians in my circles. It doesn't really require us to agree, but be to be clear about the greater or lesser significance of our differences. Well, two points to anchor the conversation Conversation before I respond. First, it's not going to take one of us to reconcile differences in Western civilization because the difference isn't between us and Catholics. It's between the whole set of Christians, the people who are uh, uh, traditional Christians. In other words, they go to church because they think it's good. Um, they don't know if any of it's true or not. The people who are uh, phil uh, philosophical Christians are deists. The people who are um, secular Christians, that they see Christianity as simply producing very good ends. We, and the people who are uh, some on the pagan side and people on the scientific side and have nothing in the atheists that have nothing to do with it, we still have to cohabitate together because we simply need our numbers. 
We have to need our numbers because we're under assault by every other people on this planet who's trying to destroy our traditions. So uh, propertarianism is a brand name that was that we use for our strictly constructed version of natural law. Natural law is as old as Western man. And it was discussed by Aristotle, by the Catholic scholastics, by the Enlightenment through the 19th century before being undermined by the post-war French, Jewish, and Russian, and now the Muslim attack on Western civilization. So I'm not asking you to argue with me in propertarianism. This is one of those things like it's arguing with uh, whether the natural law is actually true or not and whether and all I have done is make it strictly constructed so that it can be logically argued and our civilization can be explained using it as for agreeing I uh, I'm agreeing with you I'm pretty desperate to make that happen but all we have to agree on is a small set of things in other words this is all I think we need to agree on if you want to agree on more than this we'll get to that in a minute First, the West has always practiced trifunctionalism, a division of leadership between military, law, and priesthood. In some degree, generals, judges, and the priests, or whatever religion we've been in, are peers in our society, each with specific domains. Our success is in part due to the continuous equilibrium produced by our military generals, our legal jurists, and our religious priests with competition by the philosophers basically trying to undermine all of us. We have practiced heathen, in other words, hearth and nature, pagan, heroes and archetypes, and Christian, savior and saints religions. Just as some of us favor military or law or priesthood, some of us favor heroes, military, hearth, law, and Christian religion. And we differ only in the priority by which we pay our debts to heroes, nature, or God, prophet, and saints. To claim otherwise is to engage in irreciprocity. In other words, there is no religious exemption for war, and there is no heathen or pagan exemption for Christian love. Next, we resolve our differences by the laws of nature, the natural law of man, the Christian law of love, and the evolutionary law of transcendence. Those are the set of laws I know about. They are laws that are evidence of the hand of God, and if we have differences, then we can resolve our differences by those. Those. Those are the only only rules we need to do without claiming others must adhere to our belief system. In other words, our interpretation of the hand of God. Christian charity must be demonstrated by the individual not devolved to others or to the state as a means of the individual escaping his Christian obligations that his salvation come at the cost. I don't mean this that is just for Christians. I mean we are all obligated to pay the cost of extension of Christian love to all others. This is something that a lot of people that are not Christian are not going to like. Anyway, uh, Christian sat- the next one is Christian satisfaction, like free market profits, may never be obtained at the expense of kin, nation, and civilization. In other words, your Christian satisfaction by Im- immigrating third world people is a Christian satisfaction that is obtained at other people's expense, and the, those people are the expense of your kin, nation, and civilization. In other words, there is a limit to Christian charity. That is, as far as I know, the law's requirements. That's it. There's nothing else to it. So we have uh, to go over them again. The West practiced trifunctionalism. We have practiced different religions. We practice them by different priorities, just as we practice the division of labor between in trifunctionalism by priorities. We resolve our differences by the evidence of the hand of God, whether you see that God as the laws of the universe, deism, in other words, the divinity of the universe, or uh, the hand of God himself. Christian charity must must be demonstrated by the individual, and Christian satisfaction, like free markets, may never be obtained at the expense of others. That isn't Christian, that's just theft. Next question. If we're talking about rebuilding Western civilization, we need more than negative precepts. We need an overarching religious orientation as well. We need to know where we are moving towards, the positive, as well as what we are trying to prevent, the negative. The positive truth of our ultimate destiny has to be the leader in order to give sort of discernment, I'm not sure what that means, to the meaning and usefulness of those negative truths in science. Well, I'm not sure that's 
I guess that's okay. I would agree, but in legal tradition, my name is Caesar, so to speak, and as Caesar, I only resolve disputes. So not I only do law and war, the negative, I only know what we may not do. Anything that does not make war or violate the law is therefore good. It's up to the faithful to determine which of the infinite goods they choose, and it's there is a market for faithful. In other words, there are sects out there who all differ slightly in what they consider the good. We don't have to unite behind one good. We unite behind whatever goods each of us can establish at the moment. So other than preserving the laws that are evident in the hand of God, I don't know what else we have to rally around. Now it's up to you to choose. My only religious concern is to preserve all three religious traditions since intellectual normative and former religion are demanded by our people. There is no need for unity going forward or in good other than those I've stated above. You might think so, but this is because you want the least friction with others. Your intuition is saying, I want to have no friction. I want to follow the herd and have everyone be in harmony. This does not scale. There are no cases under which the rules of the family, the rules of the local group, the rules of local polity scale. There are a whole lot of basic assumptions in human discourse, the, especially the feminine intuition, that do not scale upward. At some point, there is no possible means of finding a common consent because there's too much distribution of interest. And so what happens is we have to use markets. Now, markets mean our ideas compete. As long as those are all good ideas, whatever is the most achievable and the best idea that everyone chooses is fine. Next question. Christianity is a logical axiom, the very first principle, not a separate realm of experience. This was an essential element of our original American experiment, however subdued in the documents and the persons. Well, this is one of those pseudoscience problems. Axioms are things that are arbitrarily made up. So laws are discovered as extant in the universe. So I can discover the the physical laws, natural law, the law of Christian love, and the law of evolutionary transcendence. I can discover those laws. Axioms are just things you make up. So I can make up whatever axiom I want. So I don't think that means what you think it does. That said, you're positing a Christian argument that every other faction would disagree with. It's just a bias, and it really isn't true. As a member of the founding families and the son of Puritans, I'm pretty well aware of the history of the country and the shifting nature of religion between the different regions of the country and all the classes that populated the different regions of the country, the middle-class English, the Dutch, the agrarian Germans, and the underclass Scottish and Irish still practice their ancestral distribution of attention between faith, reason, and science. We haven't changed. There's a great book on this called uh, uh, Albion Seed that talks about the four groups of people that from where they came from. And there's another uh, author who's uh, called named Manuel Todd in France who studies this as all over Europe. And it shows that whatever your ancestors did, you just continue doing. There are similarities between different sects, but the, the weights that we give to faith, family, state, science, law, these things vary between groups groups, and they tend to maintain over time. They have maintained certainly for the past couple of hundred years. Matter of fact, we can tell what faith you'll have by what crop your ancestors were raising. The settlers were Puritans. They were anti-church and anti-aristocracy. The founders were deists the, uh, and the sons of the Enlightenment, and the founders saw the church as something common people needed. They never foresaw the end of the church, or the church as a set of churches, not as the Catholic church, but as the Protestant. Protestant religion. Founders saw Christianity as something that people needed. And this is a paternal understanding of religion, not an experiential one. If that wasn't the case, otherwise Jefferson wouldn't have written the Jefferson Bible and called it the philosophy of Jesus and not as a work of mysticism. For a deist, Jesus is another philosopher that stands beside Archimedes, Aristotle, Plato, Epicurus, Zeno, and all of which are aristocratic, with Jesus providing a solution for the poor that was more respectable and more suitable to their newfound independence than the hedonistic license the poor were granted as 
slaves and serfs during pagan festivals, where pagan festivals were in fact means of keeping the underclass in their place, Christianity gave them a peerage. Unfortunately, in the East, the Jewish tradition of using the female conflict strategy worked to make Christianity a religion of conquest by undermining, in other words, trying to make it a monopoly, just as I think you are trying to do, is to try to make your vision of the church a monopoly, and in doing so, they created conflict and undermining. This undermining was designed to destroy the aristocracy they, rather than for the poor to join in peerage. In other words, the, under, the strategy of Christianity, and I believe this is what you mean, even though you don't intend it to mean, is to reduce everyone to the same low level rather than say, I have a philosophy that has a merit and has value to society and makes me a good person of equal standing, and even if I'm not aristocracy. So today, we have scientists, traditional deists, and the faithful, and the only thing they need to share is the laws of nature, the natural law of man, Christian love, and the evolutionary law of transcendence. We don't really need to act as a herd. There's too many of us. Monopoly makes people weak. We need to satisfy the needs of the different groups of people who feel, experience, imagine, and think in emotional, intuitionistic, rational, traditional, habitual, and scientific, and empirical terms. We are no longer a continent of illiterate underclasses, our people cover the spectrum. The law mediates markets, the law requires the four laws, as I stated, and each group can work together toward whatever ends they desire, as long as they don't harm each other under those laws. Those laws are the only laws we can see evident in the hand of God. They can't be false in the choice between the words of men and the hand of God. It is the hand of God that does not err. Laws of nature, natural law, Christian love, and evolutionary law don't appear to be open to error. Now, it's a crime to require others obey God's laws on your terms just as much as it's a crime for others to ask you to obey God's laws on theirs. If we all obey those laws, the means by which we explain to ourselves why we do it is immaterial unless you violate one of God's laws, the natural law, by demand for irreciprocity. In other words, unless you engage in unchristian behavior by asking others to adapt to your method of understanding. In other words, nobody gets to ask you to be an atheist. You don't get to ask anybody to look at Christianity your way either. Next question is, I'm familiar with, though somewhat removed of late, with the historical conversation about the overlap and distinction between philosophy and theology. Well, there's natural philosophy, which would be Aristotle. In other words, what we think of as empiricism and science. So that's the philosophy of the material world. Platonic philosophy, or literary philosophy, denies the supernatural and replaces it with idealism, a sort of mental abstractions like triangles and squares or abstractions. These forms exist in a platonic alternate reality, and we interact with them. Theology doesn't use abstractions, but fictional characters, archetypes, and parables. Well, it doesn't always consist of purely fictional characters. There are real people in religious history. But in general, it doesn't have to consist of real people. Both philosophy and theology rely on scriptural or textual interpretation. Not all the time, but theology. Religion doesn't, but theology does. Theology relies on scriptural or th- textual interpretation and internal consistency, if and if possible, non-contradiction. What this means is that philosophy arose from interpreting the written word, just as theology arose from uh, interpreting the written word. Uh, theology may have risen originally under uh, interpretation of traditional parables, but it, once it was written down, it, removed into, it moved into the interpretation of the written word. So if you see the similarity between written laws that must be interpreted, scriptural laws that must be interpreted, and philosophy, which is the interpretation of text independent of law or scripture, I think you sort of can see the difference between the three of them. So science relies on action, observation, and external and external correspondence instead of internal consistency of sort of linguistic statements or the internal consistency of myths and parables. In other words, a theology doesn't work if it doesn't make sense internally. When we go back into history, we look at some religions that don't make sense to us is because we, we simply are lacking too much information to make it piece together. In the ancient world, these things make sense. Once you study these things, you begin to see them pretty clearly, but in in general, everybody's framework, whether scientific, philosophical, or theological, these things have to fit together, or I'm going to say it another way, scientific, legal, and normative, philosophical, and theological, they have to be internally consistent. 
In simple terms, it's easiest to understand and incorporate narratives. It's harder to use reason and non-contradiction, and much harder to use experimentation, action, observation, and tests of external correspondence. So that means that social ideas are better conveyed by emotional parable, and done so at an early age. Argument by textual means, once you're able to write and use some logic young adulthood and experimentation adulthood when one has a great deal of underlying knowledge and time and the resources to conduct experiments. So we can increase precision from parable to reason to science and we can and then we can gracefully fall back from empiricism to reason to parable if we lack sufficient information. This is why if we have the information necessary to make a decision, we expect each other to use it. And if we lack the information, we forgive each other as long as we adhere to religious tradition. Next question. There are different views, but the Catholic position is essentially one of illumination. Reason and science are illuminated, I mean, expanded and telescoped by faith in Christ. At the same time, this is a, there is an absolute necessity to faith that doesn't exist for reason or science, and that's the case of the intellectually handicapped who can still have a relationship with the absolute. I can't get on board with any system that doesn't give these people a place to exist and contribute in this world. Well, I mean, sure, I would say this differently because I'm a scientist, and that is that without faith in Jesus' teachings, that they would produce the means and ends we believe they do, that other information may be in misunderstood, and what we learn from the, that new other information is very likely to violate Jesus' teachings and his demand for Christian love. There's a great deal of information without giving equal weight to Jesus' teachings that would be misunderstood. It would cause you to act disharmoniously with the laws of God's hand. So that's the empirical versus experiential description of the same phenomena. And it has to be. It's absolutely impossible for some of us to feel what the faithful do, just as it's absolutely impossible possible the faithful to tolerate what they cannot feel. We can't ask each other to adopt our different forms of sense blindness, and that is what the faithful as well as the atheists try to do, demand others adhere to their version of sense blindness. For some of us, the rational is more intense than the experiential. For some of us, the empirical is the only thing we can in fact sense. So some of us are colorblind and some of us can see extra colors. Uh, some of us are sense blind to some part of this sense spectrum. Now, my goal goal is that I want Christianity as a whole, as a set of sects, restored as the state religion, because without that we have learned that other religions undermine our trifunctional religion, legal, and military tradition from within, using false religions, false promises, and violations of evolutionary natural law and Christian love. I just also want to restore the right to celebrate our heathen religions. As far as I can tell, the Roman and Greek religions are lost to us. They would have to be fabricated, but the Germanic, Celtic, Nordic, Baltic, Slavic, and Finnic are, traditions are not. These religions restore war and nature, the material world, and if we don't do that, Christianity will die as well, since it's dying rather rapidly at the moment, and Catholicism the fastest of all. In other words, I would agree with the need for religion. I agree with the need for positive aspiration. I disagree that it is or ever was possible for an advanced civilization to fail to supply the philosophy and strategy in any religion suitable to the needs of the people. In other words, you have to serve the market for the people you have. You have to govern with the people you have. You have to teach with the people you have. You can't make a little ideal packet in your head and expect people to conform to it because, especially in a thing like religion where you can't compel them, you can only prevent them from competing with it. Now, I sort of want to rub your nose in something, and it's that what strategy does monotheistic religion use? It doesn't use where are we going. Instead, it uses I won't go along and I will undermine if you try to make me. This is the female strategy of demand for her satisfaction in exchange for sex, affection, and care. This is the strategy of the Christian religion. So I'm saying to you, the moment you say it has to be on my terms exclusively, you're not acting according to Jesus' teaching. You may be acting according to church dogma, which is a political system, which is a means of class warfare between sects, but it's not what Jesus taught. So, furthermore, it's not trying to take you anywhere. If you had somewhere to go, you would say it and endlessly repeat it. But I don't hear that from the Christians. What Christians say instead is, we want to double down on what we've got at the cost of everything else. I like to say, let's be a little grown up here and let's be intellectually honest.
Next question. I don't know what the idea of evolutionary transcendence means. Is it like a theory of emergentism? Um, well, I can't help you there. The faithful can conflate truth and faith, but the rest of us understand that truth is independent of faith. If instead you mean Christ was correct and that we should, all of us, seek to imitate him and his teachings by the extension of familial love to extended kin, then yes, scientifically, that's simply the optimum means of human cooperation. It's the optimum solution to the prisoner's dilemma of producing cooperation and trust, despite the fact that we exist as very diverse people with diverse set of abilities in a vast division of labor that produces a very discrete set of hierarchies. So if you mean Jesus' teachings are true, and that metaphorically Christian or church dogma is true, if we place that demand for Christian love above above all, all other demands, well then yes, that's true. If you mean, as do the fundamentalists, that the Bible is literally true rather than parables, well that's simply contrary to the variation of the Testaments themselves and the record of history. So it's not possible for scientific Christians, traditional normative Christians, philosophical Christians to conflate wisdom with truth as do theological Christians. We just can't. It's not possible. It would be like you trying to be an atheist. That's why Christianity is splitting in, into secular and fundamentalist. I mean, we're watching churches decline and we're seeing it pretty much split evenly between people who turn secular and people who turn fundamentalists. And so this is why Christianity is splitting. And just as I predicted they would with fundamentalists returning Christianity to what Jesus and intended as a folk religion. I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that it doesn't have an institution. A folk religion independent of bureaucratic institutions. I mean the church as a political institution rather than independent churches. This means that Christianity has come full circle and that we are seeing the last generation of churchianity in the West, and that all will remain is the fundamentalist Christianity as invented by American Protestants. Oh, it doesn't really matter what I think. It matters what people do. It matters what is possible given what people do. And there's nothing that can stop this change because only a certain percentage of people will do it. A government has to provide means to satisfy the needs of all people in a kin group, not just fundamentalists, especially when evidence of fundamentalist civilizations is even worse than that of the evidence of democratic socialist secular civilizations. So my job is the law, is to create a market between the sects of European religions, whether Christian, pagan, heathen, traditional, or secular, or those rather whatever people we want to call atheists that are generally hostile to the single law of Christian love. Next question. The doctrine of original sin is our only fortification against idolatry of whatever kind. The need for salvation is not a false debt. It's an instinct, and that is what is meant by the battle between flesh, original man, and spirit, man reborn, and the New Testament. The redemption of rebirth begins with acknowledgement of etc., etc., etc. It's not mere personal psychological sin either, because we know we are just social beings that can't truly be finally free until each person is with us. Well, let's talk some truth here. Well, first, the human brain evolves in two directions. Evolution didn't give us a lot of choices. We have two sexes, the male and female, and the human brain evolves in two directions in order to mature into female and male. The female is primarily experiential and empathic. The male is primarily operational, meaning actions and analytic. Each of us, whether male or female sex, develops a set of intuitions that is a combination of the spectrum on either side. In other words, there's a whole bunch of factors in there, and we tend to bias them one way or the other, and there is an aggregate bias to the male and female types, and this turns out to be the traditional things you'd expect from men and women. So uh, yet again, the leftists were wrong, we're not the same at all. Secondly, as we develop, our brain evolved from back to front, from senses to physical to social to rational calculating, and if trained, to even to be able to do computing, which is using numbers and things like that. So some of us are naturally more emotional, more physical, more social, more rational, empirical. So at this point, we have both the male-female dichotomy of analytic, action-oriented, and empathic, interpersonal, feminine-oriented. Our brain evolved to give bias toward the emotional, physical, social, rational, and empirical. 
cycle. Thirdly, our brain is divided into two primary networks and one of them into multiple sub-networks. One of those networks controls whether we spend our time feeling, daydreaming, imagining, thinking, or reasoning. The other switches between identifying new episodes of memory and saving them by rehearsing over and over again. Fourth, between these three developmental axes, each of us finds a resting place, what we consider normal or at rest or at peace or relaxed. And in that place, we experience a slightly different version of reality that is a mixture of the masculine, political, physical, operational, the left longitudinal bias, or the feminine, interpersonal, and emotional, empathic bias, the right and lateral. And this state of experience is how we assume others experience the world. In other words, it doesn't occur to us that each of us experiences the world with the same senses, uh, that we can access the world through almost the same senses if we try, but our steady state, our primary means of feeling, sensing, planning, and interacting with the world varies in in this sort of spectrum. Over time, we sort to communicate with and associate with and cooperate with people who experience similar worlds with similar means of interpreting and judging the world. And this is why we tend to sort into groups. Fifth, some of us develop better internal construction than others. The brain grows. It doesn't come into whole cloth. A lot of it grows in the womb, and over the first two years, it grows quite a bit. So some of us develop better internal construction than the others. The brain is a bit like a symphony with lots of moving parts, and if anything gets a little bit out of tune, the music of experience starts sounding a little off, and eventually it's just incomprehensible chaos, which we think of as things like schizophrenia. We call this internal construction or the harmony of the brain intelligence, but that's an abstraction. Some of us, for genetic, utero, developmental, and experiential reasons, we vary. This produces different needs for different degrees of rules, from very simple to the very abstract. In other words, you can't ask other people to have your kind of mental framing if they're not capable of it, because you're asking to do is a colorblind person to see your colors. It's the same thing with feeling, reasoning, and empiricizing, so to speak. Sixth, uh, some of us experience comfortable, easy lives of health, good family, good friends, good circumstances, and no traumas, and some of us just the opposite. This produces different needs for different methods of mindfulness. Mindfulness being what you consider spiritual harmony, having no worries, the feeling of internal peace and calm. The failure of religion, the failure to produce training in, say, stoicism or cognitive behavioral therapy, and the decline of our family, society, economy, government, and civilization are increasing demand for mindfulness. And so demand is increasing rapidly, but religion simply doesn't work except for a minority of the population. That minority is substantial, but it's always declining. So it's simply false to say that your intuition is universal, that the evidence is that it isn't. The evidence was that even during the Middle Ages that it wasn't. It certainly wasn't during the Enlightenment. It certainly isn't now. What you mean is you and those like you need this frame of reference because it is the most effective means of grasping, living, and tolerating the world that you sense, perceive, comprehend, and act in. We know why that is. We know that once people are exposed to markets for different paradigms that suit their mental experiences of the world, that they choose the paradigms that are most advantageous to them, and they choose to associate, cooperate, friend, marry, reside with, work with, and socialize with people who share those paradigms. What you're asking is for the world to conform to you, not that the not not that you cooperate with Christian love and others regardless of their paradigms and systems of understanding and experience. So to demand others satisfy you at their expense is a violation of Christian law and a violation of natural law. Next question. We need God because we know we aren't God and because God is necessary for existence. We need Jesus because we need that invitation to a loving relationship at an absolute level that only he can offer. We need the Christian church in order to share that freedom with the world and protect it through time. I actually really like this. <laughs> I would say that uh, I, 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 wrote, I uh, wrote this response and I, uh, I, I just now realized how much I agree with it. I just don't ag- I agree with all the things that that really says and I've written quite a bit about this. Uh, I just disagree that it has to be on the terms you're stating. Uh, gods, demigods, heroes, prophets, saints, and archetypes serve as the most intuitive method of comparison and calculation that's available to humans. It doesn't require anything else. We're born with it. Everything other than empathy, sympathy, and imitation is much more demanding
understanding requires much more training and experience than empathy, sympathy, and imitation of archetypes. So to say we need God is clearly false. Those people like you need God, others don't. I do. I talk to my God every day. The world is full of people who do not use or need God and are good people for the whole of their lives. There are billions who think the very idea is childish and live good lives every day. Muslim fundamentalists, quite the opposite, think they are good people and the most evil people on earth today. The most anti-civilizational force on the planet that every single civilization is fighting off just as we have for the past 1400 years. The difference is that the rest of the world is just becoming aware of it because they were so distracted by their their attempts to imitate Western civilization and rise their standard of living that they were ignoring the 1400 year assault by Islam on every higher level civilization in the world. Many of us, most of us, have that feeling of Christ's or God's love without the need for justification of it. Some of us are in families so full of love that the idea of needing more is just simply incomprehensible. In fact, they would look at the faithful as needing more love as something wrong with them. This is simply just a failure to understand that each of us has different needs for belonging. Uh, I won't go into explaining why it is we all feel these things differently, but we do. I will say that we do know that the church experience, the experience of the group, especially the group engaging in recitation or movement or chanting or dance, uh, sport or festival, all of these things really matter to us. I have written about that elsewhere, so I'm not going to cover it again here. And like the Founding Fathers, one can just as easily rely on deism, the anthropomorphization of natural laws, the traditional law of sovereignty and reciprocity, noblesse oblige, the Christian mandate to the aristocracy to behave in a Christian fashion, and the loyalty to Christian commoners and the priesthood that cares for them because we are ourselves already valuable in the sexual, social, economic, political marketplace and need no substitute for that success. In other words, there is no negative coming at us. There's nothing. We live in a world of positive affirmation, so this need does not exist. The impulse to hedonism doesn't exist. These impulses just don't exist. This is why Christian ethics remain constant across the intellectual spectrum and why faith remains constant across the intellectual spectrum. But the expression of that faith varies from unquestioning devotion to questioning devotion to ritual recital because they believe it's good for them and others, and some sort of deism or spiritualism and purely scientific understanding that Christianity is the optimum religion for converting poor people into good citizens in a civil society that you want to to develop into a majority middle class. So again, my job is the law, not faith. Faith and the good are up to you. Falsehood and decidability are up to math, science, and law. Law can't adjudicate differences in faith stated by man. It can only adjudicate differences in the words and deeds of man by the evidence of God's hand that we observe in the physical, natural, Christian, and evolutionary laws. So to stay on message, I work for Caesar. I resolve disputes that peop- so that people can move forward. That's the job of the law. The faithful, rational, empirical may choose to argue what is best in whatever terms they wish. The job of the law is not to assert the positive, nor is it to impose a singular positive frame for human experience. It is to prohibit the use of ignorance, error, bias, deceit, fraud, coercion, harm, and violence so that the faithful, the rational, and the empirical can cooperate by trade on those commons they in, in whose interest they share, not create a monopoly at the expense of the cognitive and material needs of others." The faith is one player in a triumvirate of military law and faith. There is no place for law in war nor in faith, only in disputes between them. There is no place for faith in law or war, only in our consolation after them. There is no place for war in law or faith, only in our defense of them. And this is our civilization. This has always been our civilization for 5,000 years. The Jewish post-war attempt to create a state monopoly by abusing the law, ending the balance between military law and faith, is the cause of our failure to adapt to modernity by and preserving that relationship between of trifunctional leaders. And any Christian attempt to repeat the actions of the post-war Jews using the church is just as evil as legal or military monopoly. And if you try to say it otherwise, then clearly I'm sorry, but you're the enemy of the people.
So trifunctionalism is war, law, and faith. We specialize, and the market between us maintains our excellences. Our excellences is our ability to adapt rapidly to change, seize every opportunity, and vent opportunity as possible so that may we may obey God's law of transcendence of man into the gods he wished to sit beside him. This is Kurt Doolittle. Thank you for listening. Thank you.